confessions of a sysadmin. Um, you know, we went back and forth on whether explaining why we decided to do this at a cybersecurity conference, but really I think we'd like to tell you a little bit of a backstory about how this talk came to be. This talk came to be when I hit a pretty big wall of burnout and I was done and I didn't want to do Linux anymore because I was so tired of the community. I kept feeling like I kept having to prove that I was worthy enough to be part of the community, that I was technical enough, that I was good enough, and it got tiring. It just got draining. And I kind of started playing around with InfoSec and figured out, like, this community is so different. It was, okay, you're new, so why are you telling me that? Grab your laptop, sit down, we're going to do this. Like, and I talked to Allie about it and started finding that even in my gusto to go and mentor other people and talk to them, I found a lot of that negativity inside of me. And I'd start making comments, like making a lot of fun of Allie for running Arch. It's my favorite thing to make fun of her about. Um, and I was like, this isn't healthy. So this talk came about for me as just a way to get this off all of my chest and be like, this is where we are. This is the state of the Linux union for me right now and kind of challenge all of you to help me change the world. And Ellie, why did you jump on? Because <laughs> you told me to? No. I no. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so like Elle, I was just really burnt out with work and kind of like I have a career, but I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Elle, what do I do with my life? <laughs> Elle's like, come do talks with me. Yeah. So, And then we kind of sat down in a coffee shop and ranted for a really long time and this talk was born. This, this is what we came up with. So I guess we should introduce ourselves, though. Um, so my name, for those of you that aren't my friends who are coming to support right now, um, is El Marquez. And I'm the community architect for Linux Academy. Now, really, I could sit here and tell you all the great things I've done and the cool stuff I've done. But if you know me, you know that I just tell people I'm a professional noob. Look, I love learning new things. And with that comes breaking them. It comes trying to figure out how to do it, imposter syndrome, finding mentors, trying to build a community around teaching it. And really, it's just the exploration of being new and having fun doing it. Hey, everyone. I'm Allie. Um, I'm the Cloud Operations Engineer over at InfoSite. We're a small cybersecurity startup. Um, I basically manage our infrastructure. That's all. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, before we get started, we're going to gonna... give you a resource. I promise this is not self-promotion. Um, our slides are a bit lacking when it comes to words because I speak enough for all three of us. So um, every resource that we give you when it comes to capture the flag, when it comes to resources, when it comes to Linux distributions can all be found on a GitHub repo. So you don't have to worry about taking pictures or trying to figure that all out. The website is lopunk.com. So we can kick off now. I think everybody should be in if you are looking to sneak in, except for this one person who I'm going to call out now. <laughs> and that is we can go to confession number one. And that's, you know, when I started out in the Linux community, we can go ahead and play it because I'm reading it. <laughs> uh, when I started out, I really wanted to belong part of it, really wanted to feel like I belonged part of the community. I didn't want to just sit behind a terminal and do my job by myself. And however, the more that I tried, the more that I tried to join meetups and come to conferences, the more that I felt like I couldn't get past the front gate. And really, that kind of brings us to our first lesson for you guys, and that's the fact that gatekeeping happens. Like, I wish I could tell you that we've solved this problem, that gatekeeping was a thing of the past. But if you're going to tackle something new, if you are going to show that vulnerability and show up and say, hey, I don't know how to do this, and I am here because I want to learn. Someone's going to look at you and say, well, how do you not know this? How long have you been here? And they caught that attitude. It's gotten to the point that a question as simple as, what is Linux, has turned into a gatekeeping question. So if I say, Ali, what is Linux, what would you say? I would tell you, Linux is an operating system. And then this is when you start getting people who, uh, you know, the gatekeeper, their face changes. They get a bit of a low-key look. They stand a little bit straighter, and they're like, oh, no. Linux is not an operating system. Linux is a kernel. Really, have we not matured past the point where we can have an honest conversation? Yes, once upon a time, Linux was nothing more than a kernel. And then we open source, and then we grew, and then we learned. And now Linux is both. Linux can be referred to as an operating system. There are Linux distributions. There are Linux kernels, or well, low Linux kernel that is in development. All of these are right answers. And by shutting someone down with a question as simple as that, we do absolutely no favors to our community. And you know what? No one is immune from this. I was lucky enough to go to uh, Open Source Summit and, uh, oh, we were going to slide behind. <laughs> 
Well, anyways, uh, I was lucky enough to go to Open Source Summit, and I'm sitting there, second row, as Linus Torvald is being interviewed. And the interviewer looks at him and says, Linus, like, how do you understand every single line of code that's in the kernel? He looks at her and admittedly says, I don't. I don't have to. And at this point, the room erupted. People pull out their phones, they're tweeting, they're taking pictures. And this is what I see on the news feeds the next day. And this is a bit ridiculous, because if they had actually put their phone away and listened, they would have heard that what he said is, I don't, because I don't have to. What I need to understand is the big picture. By understanding where I want the project to go, where the project has been, I can look at a line of code and see if it fits in within the vision. So this is the lesson that we're here to share with all of you, is yes, gatekeeping happens, but you know what? I have never, not once, furthered my career by trying to appease those gatekeepers. What I've furthered my career by is going and finding the other people who say, hey, I'm new too, but I'm willing to go on this adventure with you. And through that, all you need is a starting point. You don't have to be able to do you know, mal reverse malware engineering and get down to the bits from day one. It's a ridiculous ask. But if you have the big picture, if you've learned a little bit of coding, and you've learned a little bit of the OS, and you've learned a little bit of you know, pen testing, whatever your interest is, it's easier to pick these things up. Um, and for those of you who are new, and I just threw this out for you um, on lopunk.com, I actually have a study group that I held to tackle that gatekeeping question of what is Linux. We go down from the basics of the Linux kernel down to why is the mascot a freaking penguin anyways. <laughs> So my confession, <clears throat> a lot of times I have psyched myself into thinking that Linux is a lot harder to use than it actually is. I did this a few ways, um, trying to use harder distros than my skill set allowed at the time, um, trying to use the wrong tools for the job, basically setting myself up for failure and for days where I was like, I hate Linux, I hate it, I don't understand it, it doesn't make sense. Um, but that's okay. Um, so I just have this. Al yeah. likes to make fun of me about using R. And you know what? When I started out on Linux and I'm sitting there with my little Ubuntu laptop, they tell me, you know, a real Linux admin uses Arch. So it's always been a... It's kind of, yeah, just like a long running joke. But <laughs> you don't have to use Arch. You don't have to start off on Arch right away. Don't do that. You're going to make yourself hate Linux because you're going to be like, what is this? This makes no sense. Um, so picking a Linux distribution. There are a couple things to keep in mind. Um, the first one is your workload. So what are you going to be using this computer for? Is it Are you going to be managing enterprise production environments? Are you going to be browsing the internet and YouTube? Are you going to, you know, I don't know, travel, whatever, do CTFs, <laughs> run VMs? Think about things like that um, when you're trying to pick a Linux distribution. Also, different features you want. It can be a whole other talk in itself to talk about desktop environments, so I'm not even going to go into it. but. Things like that, that over time of using Linux, you'll start getting your own preferences and things that you're comfortable with on your own. And the last thing is keep in mind your skill set. Um, some people do learn by installing Arch first thing on the first day of using Linux and can just pick things up. I don't know, it's magic, but in general, we all kind of take baby steps learning Linux. So keep that in mind. Um, you don't have to re-kick your laptop every time. We probably already know this in here. Run VMs. Um, if there's a new Linux distro that's out, throw it on a VM and try it out. Um, plug for L's OS challenge right now. Yes, if any of you are thinking about choosing Linux, I challenge you to join me. Every single month I kick to a brand new Linux distribution. I started out with elementary OS, went to OpenSUSE, currently running Pop! OS, and the next one we're running is Clear Linux. Do it as a group because we can support each other when we break things, and we will break things. Yeah. And also, if you're already comfortable with Linux, keep learning it. Um, don't lock yourself into one distro. Um, have an open mind about it, because if you're like me, you'll go into your career being like, oh, I learned on Fedora, I support Red Hat, that's all I know. And then you get hit with a layoff, and you go to an Ubuntu shop. You can pick it up, but it's kind of like setting yourself up for a learning curve. Yeah. Um, so lessons we just want you to take away from this is use the right tools for what you need. Work smarter, not harder, right? Um, and don't lock yourself into one distro. Make sure you keep an open mind and keep learning. Of course, there may be distros that you're like, I hate Arch, I hate Pac-Man. Ugh, gross. But I never said that. At least, no, I know. I know you didn't say that. <laughs> but, you know, if you feel like that way about a certain distro, we all have our preferences. Um, but just keep an open mind to... <laughs> 
to right. what you want. So confession <laughs> number three. And you're going to push the button for me. All right. And it's, okay, when I started out, everyone said, use the tools in your toolbox, right? Make use of everything that you have. And what I found is the GUI is freaking easy. You touch a button and it works. And this became one of the biggest gatekeeping things for me is they're like, oh, well, real Linux, a real Linux admin uses the command line. Why? And so, like, everything, there is definitely an XKCD comic that goes with it. Let me give you guys a moment to look at this. And many of you, especially Linux users, are going through the man page in your head right now. Going, that, see, I can see the looks of the people going, wait a minute, like, okay, flag, X, wait, there's something about a B, which was a J, where do I? <laughs> Why? If you are have the option of using a desktop, then you would go to the file, and you'd simply click the button, and it's out where you need it to be. Yes, if you are on a server, you might have to learn how to use all this, but one of my favorite things to do at a conference, especially a Linux conference, is to sit in the background and watch people try to get on the Wi-Fi, because you see them committed to NMCLI, <laughs> tap, 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 and you'll say like, hey, if you just go to the GUI, no, no, I got this, look, tap, tap, it gives you the options. By that point, I've clicked the GUI, clicked accepted, and I'm on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> we definitely goes back to the work smarter, not harder, and yes, use all of the tools that you have available to you in your toolbox. You know, if I asked you to come over and help me hang some frames, yes? I would say, do not be reliant on the GUI. Understand what it does under the hood. Yeah, I mean, like we said, use yes. all of the tools. Don't become, I only use the GUI, because then you limit yourself to not have the functionality that Linux gives you. And, and Microsoft don't. proper and Oh, get there, hold on, stop with the spoiler alerts. That's another slide. <laughs> um, but yeah, if I asked you to come to my house and help me hang some you know, pictures and you showed up with a screwdriver, I'd be like, all right, I mean, we can do this. You can get the <laughs> screwdriver and sit there and do it. Or the same way if I asked you to help me with my pipes and you showed up with a hammer, I mean, all right, we can get it done, but this is just silly. You're just trying to prove a point that you don't have to prove. You're impressing no one but yourself at that point. Which gets us to confession number four. Everybody in here already knows this confession. Technology sucks sometimes. Um, there are lots of days where I really want to shut my laptop, quit my job, move to the mountains, raise goats. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> have the local children believe that I'm a witch and never uh, interact with anybody or technology ever again. And that's fine. We all have days like that. Um, to make my point, I'm going to tell you a story um, about when I was a baby Linux admin. And I had two monitors that worked fine with Fedora. Um, one day, my boss decides, like, okay, you're not a baby Linux admin. You're worthy of that third monitor. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's how you know you moved up in Linux. Yes, skills that's how you know. Monitor. That's Just a promotion. Know. Yeah. <laughs> so I got another monitor. I'm like, cool, great. Um, well, I thought I could just plug it in and it would work. I spent six to eight hours probably fighting with Xorg. I cried. My mentor was like, how do you have a job here? Uh, it was a bad day, right? So um, I solved my problem, honestly, by switching distros. To Arch. Yeah, I switched to Arch <laughs> that day. That is the day that I switched to Arch Linux, honestly. But it worked. It just worked in that case. So Which, question for me kind of ties into this, because when she told me the story, I related to it. You know, most of the time when I'm trying to do something with Linux and it doesn't work, I blame myself. I'm like, this is my fault. I don't know. I'm not technical enough. You know, I really should just buy a Mac and use what everybody else uses. And when she told me the story, I looked at her and I was like, you know, did this happen kind of like at the end of 2015 kind of era? Because I remember this, it's Fedora pushed an update that broke the XORG files and it meant everyone on my row lost their third, fourth, and fifth <laughs> monitors. Um, but we weren't on the same team. She wasn't able to get that communal experience. And I got to the point where I was doing the Linux distros um, and the challenges and I kept breaking things. And at the time I found a guy by the name of uh, Jason who does a program called Choose Linux and we started doing distro hopping together where I started documenting every change I made on a new distro so that when someone says, oh, well, what'd you do? You know, how'd you break it? I'd say, oh, go look at my uh, files. My error logs are there. Every single command I've run on the command line since I got this box is on there. And um, it got to the point where we ended up in a pretty big flame war, if you follow me on Twitter, with a major Linux distribution where they were pushing back that it was my fault. I pointed them to the logs and uh, we got some good changes going on in that actual distro. 
But this happened because we did it as a community, we did it as a group, and when I said this is broken, someone said, oh, it's broken on mine too, and pushed their logs up as well. So we challenge you that if you're going to do it, don't always believe that it's yourself. Take a chance, try new distros, try new applications, learn something new, but do it in the OS challenge mindset. Do it with a friend, find a mentor. There are many times where I'm like, hey, I wanna learn how to do CTF, Allie, like, can I have you on standby? And I'll go do something and it won't work and she can jump on and help me troubleshoot what was going on to see is it me or is it that environment that isn't working? You'd be amazed how many times it's the environment that's not working. Okay, so next confession. <clears throat> a lot of times um, when I have a question that I feel like the answer is something that I should already know, I hesitate to ask that question. And I'm sure everyone in here has probably done this about something, but um, I just want to tell y'all, it's okay not to know. It's okay to ask questions. I it's know. okay to be new. <laughs> I thought we talked about new using this photo of me on this slide. I'm sorry, but it's so good for the <laughs> confession. Um, so... You know, you're kind of cheating yourself. You know, a lot of people say, there's no such thing as a stupid question. But like Elle said earlier, sometimes you'll say, I don't know what SSH is. Can someone explain that to me? And if you're in a room full of Linux people, How do you, not you know might get a response that's like, you don't know what SSH is? Ugh, like, what are you doing? And it's just like a crappy feeling, right? So it's okay not to know, and it's okay to ask dumb questions. It's okay to ask the simple questions, because even giving this talk, I realized, if you're thinking a question that you probably don't know the answer to that you perceive as basic, there's probably someone else in the room that's thinking the exact same, like, I don't know what this is. Um, so when not knowing the answers, we all know it's a matter of Google foo. Like Al likes to say, as you progress throughout your career, you will get better at Googling things. And pointing Google will probably point you to some documentation of whatever product you're struggling with. Um, the documentation is your friend, and I would encourage you, if you get you know, an urge to give back to the community, start with documentation. That's a great way to start contributing. If you see something that's outdated on a community doc, update it. Submit a pull request. Which yep. leads us to 5A, and it's the one that I hate giving because, God, I hate getting it as a response. And that's, you know what, guys? Sometimes we really do have to read that friendly manual. You know, when I showed you guys the picture of the XKCD comic, and I've actually seen this. I swear to you, I'm giving the talk, somebody with their phone under the table, Googling what the options are. And I'm like, you know, if you just go to the man pages, and especially if you're on a terminal, do backslash example, you'll get exactly what you need. There are people who have dedicated their careers to documentation, who have spent so much time trying to make these tools easy for you to learn. Yeah, you can go to Stack Overflow, and four and a half hours later, you'll have 16 different ways to do something. Or you can go to the... <laughs> or you can just go to the documentation for the product that you're using. And here's the thing. Many of you are like, oh, well, I try to go to the documentation and the answer's not there. Cool. Did you update it when you found the answer? We have to write the docs. We have to be willing to give back in that way. And so our lessons for you here is, yes, Google is your friend, but so is documentation. And I encourage you, if you've had to do something twice and you didn't find the answer, go write it for someone else. You're not the only one that's struggling with this. And it's the only way that we can truly grow an open source community. Okay, confession number six. This one makes me nervous. So I've got some certifications, right? These red hat ones. And a lot of times when job hunting and things like that, I feel like it gets my profiles looked at. Um, but I don't feel like it displays who I am as an engineer fully. Um, you know, people walk up with these certs all the time, and it's a cool label to have, right? Like, oh, wow, he's an RHCA, great. Um, but do you know what you're talking about beyond the cert? Um, when you come on a Linux admin floor, we can smell our own, right? So if you walk around with an RHCSA, for example, that's great. So we may know you know how to do some basic Linux stuff, but... Do you actually know what it's doing, or did you study for an exam? So that leads us to our next one, which is the fact that, you know, going to a boot camp, which is what a lot of people do, is great. It can give you a start, but it's not going to make you a command line ninja. And many times when you have that person that has that certification, and we, they get on the floor, and as Ali said, we can smell our own, they end up becoming a story that we all have. And so I'm going to share with you my story about the day that I met the world's very first OpenStack Java developer. Now, if you don't know OpenStack, it is 100% written in Python. That's all that it's written in. 
So I go in, I introduce myself, and this guy is standing so tall, and he's so proud. And he tells me about how he just graduated with a degree in OpenStack Java development. Now at this time, I'm an OpenStack trainer. And this guy is just so confident that I'm under the phone going, like, texting the foundation going, guys, what did I miss? Like, did I miss an email? Like, this is huge. This is going to change my job. And eventually the texts start coming in with LOL. L, you're being punked. Seriously, L, you can't tell. I'm like, this guy is so confident. So I'm talking to him. I'm trying to pull it out. And then I find out that he went through a boot camp and got a certificate of completion in full stack Java development. You only go as far as you actually dig into the technology. What will set you apart is that hands-on time. Because you know what? Yeah, I came from a certification, from a boot camp certification program. And I can tell you that my day started at 6 a.m. and went well past 1 a.m. I got very little sleep and I spent as much time behind the command line and behind the GUI that I could. Which brings us to our confession 6B. So neither of us have a computer science degree. Um, we both agree that your knowledge is what defines you. Didn't mean to switch that yet. <laughs> um, to make this point, we're going to tell you three stories really quick. So I'm going to start with mine. I'm a high school dropout. I'm a double college dropout. Never completed any like formal education. Everything I've learned has been on the job, through mentors, through the community, community from the internet. Um, and that's about it. I'm a product of my mentors as far as my Linux knowledge goes. Um, so yeah, this is the perfect place for me to, to make this confession. That's true. Given that this is St. Mary's <laughs> University where I'm from. Um, so hi, I have a college degree in Christian theology. I went to school with the great hopes to go and be a missionary, and I graduated right about the time the Catholic scandals occurred with um, sexual abuse and everything. It was not the right time to become a missionary. And you know what? I needed a job, and I needed something to do, and that's how I found myself in the Linux world. Uh, but no, I, I've had absolutely no formal training. Sorry, camera guy, I walk when I... <laughs> Um, when it comes to Linux. Um, however, one of my mentors, Eric Joslin, is amazing. And he does have a computer science degree. I believe he actually has a master's. And what makes him amazing is when I ask him a question and I want to know the deep dive. I want to know how those system calls are actually occurring for me to be able to understand. He will show up with one of his college textbooks. Ten years after the fact, he can turn to the right page, show me the highlighted section, and start talking like he was just studying this yesterday. He became a product of an education that allowed him to actually dig beyond the command line. He kind of started memorizing his books. He, books became a part of him, and it was just amazing to me to say, like, okay, you don't, you didn't just read it. You actually understood it. So whether you decide to go through a certification program, you decide to teach yourself, our lessons for you are pretty simple, and that is nothing beats hands-on experience. Like You can cram for a test all you want, and you can go and copy and pasta and basically cert dump, and it'll get you the job. But like Ali said, we can smell our own, and you don't want to become somebody's story. And also, what defines you is not just what you know, but how much can you impart. I always tell people, it's cool that you know that, but I don't believe you until you can teach me or you can teach others. Give back to the community. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> at me for this confession, okay? I used to do um I used to use a Mac to do my Linux assignment work. Um I didn't hate it as much as you might think. Um so I was at a point where I don't know, my workstation just kept breaking for me when I was running Linux, no matter what distro, right? I just got sick of this struggle where I'm like, man, I have to come in and troubleshoot my workstation in order to do work. That is so annoying. And I just got enough seniority with Rackspace to where I got an Apple computer one day, basically. It was really random, actually. Um, can you blame Arch for that? I, I can <laughs> blame Arch for that one, actually, 100%. Arch is full. No. Um, but it, I, I didn't hate it, and I wanted to throw this in here because I think it's important. You don't have to run Linux necessarily to be a Linux admin. That's a great way to learn Linux, sure. But not all Linux admins and engineers, obviously, run Linux. Um, and that's, a, that's totally okay, I think. Which kind of brings us to the point made earlier that stole the thunder. Um, my favorite <laughs> Linux distribution is currently Windows. Um, and that's because there are some amazing things being done with the Linux subsystem when it comes for Windows. It's gone so far beyond PowerShell that I can tell you that I am a complete noob to it. 
But I can tell you that if you're interested in making money in this industry, knowing Linux, but being able to use it in a Windows environment down to a Dockerized environment when it comes to it, Windows containers for Linux, Linux containers for Windows, you're writing your own check, especially if you can do that on the cloud with Azure. We need to stop getting towards the point where we say, we say, we need to get to the point where we say we are system admins, whether that be for a cloud environment, whether that be for Azure, whether that be for Windows, whether that be for Linux, and I can do it all on my Mac or my Chromebook and it doesn't matter. It's your skills. Have I said that enough, guys? Um, but we are going to go on a side note and a side rant here, and that's something that um, really kind of becomes an obstacle for a lot of people because they say, well, you know, I can't go run a Mac. I can't afford one. Well, let me show you this example of this guy, great guy by the name of Richard, and he teaches a school in Ghana. And he wanted his kids to be able to be prepared for being able to use things like Microsoft Word. But they didn't have electricity. They didn't have computers. So every morning he would come in and he would draw what a Word environment looked like, what a PowerPoint environment would look like, and he would walk his kids through using it on a blackboard. This is one of those problems that I think I was talking to somebody earlier about where we try to solve all human problems with tech. And so Microsoft found out about Richard and they're like, man, he's doing some great things. So they packed up a bunch of computers and they shipped it to him so that the kids could now learn how to use Microsoft in real life. Did I mention the part where I said the school doesn't have any electricity? Yeah. Did they send the generator? <laughs> Did they send the generator? Yeah, so once again, yes, I do say that hands-on knowledge is what's going to get you there. Sometimes we have to get creative on how we get that hands-on knowledge. One thing that we talked about is when I started out in this industry, I told you guys that I went through a boot camp. What I didn't tell you is that I don't come from a technical background. My very first computer that I got was what they handed me at Rackspace when I was hired. I learned Linux through talking the local library into letting me use their VMs, through borrowing friends' computers, through sitting there with my CompTIA book and drawing things out trying to understand it. Really, the only limitation you're going to have is your own creativity. So we have a little bit of advice for you guys. So, Al, what do you say for those in here who want to get started with Linux? If you want to get started with Linux, well, first and foremost, choose Linux. Now, she did say that you don't have to re-kick a computer to it, but if you can, it really is the best way to get started. The way that I mentor people is if we have two computers, one can be your daily driver, the other one you've chosen Linux in. Every single day, pick up the Linux box and use it to the point where you've broken it. Do as much as you can. Then you can finish your day off, you can go back to your regular computer, finish your day at work, and then come back and learn how to troubleshoot. No matter what your job is in the tech industry, your troubleshooting skills are going to be what gets you through. So why not get them actually getting that hands-on experience by choosing whatever Linux distro that you want to? So after you've chosen Linux, next piece of advice we have for you would be to, I put Ansible here, but it doesn't have to be Ansible, just learn some automation. Um, I say this because this great DevOps word, right? That's where the industry's going. Um, you're going to get in a Linux spot, and you're probably going to have to write some automation, whether it be Ansible, Puppet, Chef, whatever. It's probably going to happen. Um, so once you have that down. <laughs> this is the worst piece of advice for me to give them. I give it to you because I need to take my own advice, and that's learn a scripting language. Bash will get you through. Um, I always get made fun of because I can write a mean Bash script. It'll take me a thousand lines to write what you can in two lines of Python, but you know what? My script worked, and that's what matters. But realistically, if you're going to be involved in the tech industry, regardless of what you're doing, scripting can help you, especially when it comes down to actually troubleshooting. The little bit of scripting that I know has really helped me be able to parse logs better and to really be able to understand what it is that I'm looking at. I'd love to tell you that your environments are never going to break, but I don't care what distribution, what OS you're using. At some point, if you're having fun and you're learning new things, you're going to break it, just like you should. People I have a few gray beards in the room. Yeah, people in the room who are watching this talk who are like, I already know all this. I run Linux all the time. I'm a, I'm a Linux master. Um, so fine, you can use Arch. Um, oh, these aren't updating. Oops. We are off on the screen. That's all right. All right. Well, I'll just read it to you. Yeah, I'll just read it to you. So, oh, lost connection. That's why. Great. Okay. Um, so just keep learning Linux, even if you're running Arch, even if you're a Linux genius, I would suggest keep learning. Um, you know, some things you can do is things like the OS challenge with L um, that bounces to different distros. Keep your mind open, try new things. Um, but also, I would suggest trying to build your own Linux. 
Um, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, and once you feel comfortable with Linux, especially on like a senior level, I challenge you to give back to the community and spread that knowledge. Um, that really is what's going to define you as a Linux engineer. All right. And for those InfoSec people in the room, Ali, how would you suggest that? Yeah, so I have this really cool slide that you can't see with all of these um, CTF platforms that While you can you try I'll try to fix it. Okay. Um, it might be on Oh, we lost connection to the server. That's fine. So, okay. Just keep talking. InfoSec, newbies, I uh, got into things like this by playing Capture the Flags. Um, granted, I'm still a cloud ops engineer at cybersecurity place, so I kind of took the approach of going into the industry but doing a job that I know how to do already, um, and that way I can like learn from my coworkers who are doing threat analysis and stuff like that. Um, so playing capture the flags, does everybody in here know what a capture the flag is? Does anybody brave enough to admit they don't know what it is? All right, yeah. we're at the right place. Yeah, we're at the right place. <laughs> everybody knows what it is. I don't need to talk about this anymore. No, just kidding. Um, so we've got like Pico CTF, we've got Hack the Box, Over the Wire, things like that. You can Google like CTF platforms and get that information. Um, Elle and I have played a few of these. Uh, if you're the kind of person who likes to learn in a group, I would challenge you to try and join a CTF team um, for the women and those who identify as women and non-binary. Um, Girls Taking Over is an awesome group. Um, there's also Cult of the Party Parrot and Open to All CTF. Those are both CTF teams that are awesome. And you can just like follow them on Twitter. They'll probably add you to a Slack channel. That's how oh. Girls Taking Over does it. Um, and you know, you can just kind of collaborate. And if you want to do a capture of the flag, you can. I will note though that if some of you are like, well, I'm really new. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done a CTF. I literally told Ali, you know, hey, I started studying for my security plus. I want to do a CTF. And every girl in that group was like, you should join. Hey, how are you doing? How can we help you? So most of these groups are extremely inclusive regardless of where your tech uh, skills are. If you're brand new, if you don't know anything, join anyway. Like it's fun. It, you know, people who already know everything in there are excited to teach you about whatever we're doing. So I encourage you to join Enid, even if you have no expertise or knowledge. Yeah, definitely. Um, plug for CTF time. If you have like a free weekend and you're like, I want to do some CTF practice this weekend, you can go here and it'll show you um, what remote enabled CTFs are going on at a certain date. And we're kind of coming to the end of our talk. So we want to give you the final lesson. And that's something that you've heard me say quite a few times today. And that's, you know what? You're going to break some, and we're keeping this family friendly because my kid is in the background. So we're going to break some shirt. And you should. Like, I don't know where they came to be this communal knowledge, this communal agreement that you should always do everything perfectly and you should be good from day one because you know what when you're going through it, it it's hard and you're not learning if you're not pushing your boundaries so both of us are going to stand up here and we're going to have a moment of vulnerability and we're going to tell you about a time that we broke a shirt <laughs> yeah so <clears throat> like what probably a month ago right now um Elle and i are sitting at a coffee shop talking about this talk that we're giving right now I go home after I've got to do a maintenance. So I wait and I go and log in to do my maintenance. Uh, what do I do? I accidentally delete a database node. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that's not working. Okay. okay, we figured it out. Did you? I figured it out. I can GUI. Well, uh, I felt that so hard. So. That's her boss. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah, so I, I blew out a database node. And so I that's the face I made when this happened and this database go node was gone from the console all of a sudden. That's probably. That's my boss's reaction <laughs> that I wanted to show y'all. Um, literally, I told him, oh, I just blew out this database node and I'm panicking. He's like, oh, man, you know what? That's my fault. I should have had termination protection on. Rebuild it. We got backups. Let's just get this back online. No one got mad at me. No one blamed me. They made fun of me. That was about it. That was the worst thing that happened. <laughs> Similarly, when I started uh, at this other startup I worked at, you know, the first thing they told me, you're going to break production. We're telling you right now it's okay. That's when I learned about the concept of fail forward. Learn from your mistakes. Own your mistake. It's okay. But <laughs> I'm like, I'm too careful. I'm not going to break production. And she broke production Literally the next right day. Literally after talking about this talk. Yeah. All right, so we go to my story, and I can't let her outdo me. So I'm going to tell you guys about how I broke 
What? Sorry. Just stop playing with it. How I broke production the very first hour on my first day on my first job at Rackspace. And, oh, I love this story. So, they sit me down, they're like, here's your computer. And you know, they're trying to get me out of the way, really, because they've got stuff to do. And like, all right, hey, run this maintenance for us. I'm like, I don't even know how to like answer the phone. What do you mean run this maintenance for us? I'm like, no, no. And I quote, it is written so well that a monkey could run it. Well, I mean, I can't be outdone by a monkey. So I get on, I pull on my computer, and I'm looking at this maintenance. And this is really weird. There are like four commands. We're updating a database. OK, something called a MySQL cluster. Like, I knew MySQL. I'm not really sure what the word cluster meant. But you know, I can't really ask. And they know. Right? So uh, somebody had made the mistake of teaching me that you could pull up a terminal, and you could broadcast across multiple terminals. So me going, why did they set two hours for this like four command maintenance? I'm going to really impress them. So I log into each one of these nodes. I broadcast across. I run the updates. And I click restart. And there went the customer's MySQL live database. And what did I find out when my phone started ringing? This customer was a major bank in the UK. And how did they find out that their environment was down? <laughs> Twitter was blowing up. Customers couldn't get to their money. The reason that they had two hours allocated for this is that this MySQL uh, cluster hadn't been updated in over a year. So there were quite a few updates that had to happen. And we were down for a really, really long time. Or maybe I just remember it being hours. <laughs> um, but the lesson that I learned in this is that I was on the right team. And that's because you know what happened? Absolutely nothing happened to me. My teammate stepped up and said, we screwed up. We should have explained this to you. Somebody should have sat with you when we did this. They handled the customer calls. And then about two weeks later, when I was assigned to another maintenance for this customer, and they understandably called and said, we don't want L running our maintenance, <laughs> the team stood up for me and said, you know what, no, this was not an L fault. She's the face of it, but we made the mistakes. We're going to sit with her. We're going to train her. And you don't get to pick and choose on a company like that. And that's really kind of what brought us to come and show our vulnerability here. And if you guys have seen this little penguin around, this is really what I'm living my life by. The concept that it's OK to be new, that it's OK to fail forward. And you know what? You don't have to please any of the neckbeards in this room, because this journey is your own. With that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Or what usually ends up happening is joining you in the hall and having you guys tell us about the time that you broke production. Thank you very much. We spread the hell through that. I know. Ooh, but and for those of you that do want to choose Linux, we oh, do yeah. have choose Linux stickers. <laughs> and um, we're making it rain. <laughs> Yep, you have to keep growing. I've heard that multiple times. Yeah. Vim. I am a Vim person. <laughs> I don't think I have gone into Emac twice and been having to Google how to get out. <laughs> I will own that. I've done it probably more, actually more than twice. I never remember. <laughs> I have a question as far as I know there was a you know, There is what I'm sorry? Okay. Distros they have a stop user inclusions or info inclusions. So there's a disconnect. Is there something out there that says these have the following issues with docs? So my favorite distros are those who keep up-to-date documentation, like Cop OS. Um, Ubuntu is pretty good. I have my issues with OpenSUSE. They say that their documentation is up-to-date. I can prove that it's not. Um, <laughs> however, um, most, of, uh, most of the times what I end up doing is I actually end up installing the man pages if they're not available. I'm a man page user. That readability is easier for me. I think you said you use info more. Um, that's one of the great things that we go with open source is you're not limited to the tools that you downloaded that distro with. Um, honestly, I, I don't know if there is a master list that tells you why or how they're going that way. I think it really is down to the developers and what they want to include. But 
I mean, we open source for a reason, right? Like you can get whatever tool you want to get. I, I more than once have gone to Google and typed in man and gone to the man pages. <laughs> We so um, one of the Linux distro one of the links one of the podcasts we run is BSD now. Um, so yes, I know those debates quite well, and I'm saying you know what at this point in my career that's gatekeeping because I'm not there yet. I'm just kind of playing with it and trying to figure it out, and one day I will run a BSD distribution, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> you know, my daughter's back there. She's writing a talk right now about Linux. Sorry, I'm throwing you out there about Linux through a nine-year-old's just. And we sat down and talked to her about. She's running her Chromebook. You know what? She's running Linux for all intents and purposes. For all she needs to know, she is. So. Did you say both of our moms run Linux. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we have. Both of our moms run Linux. Yeah. It's easier for me to troubleshoot it. Same. That's why I put Linux on that computer. The original. For the, yep. <laughs> so, sorry. Anyone else? Don't forget to get your stickers. <laughs> All right, thank you guys.